Hi everybody, welcome to Photographer's Coffee Morning. I'm sat here again with the amazing Dennis Roy Coronel. And this is actually going to be a part two to the previous interview we did with him. So if you want to get a bit of an understanding about his background, his general photography skills, feel free to go back and listen or watch that episode. Uh, but today we're going to have a bit more of a, a, a nerdy discussion, if that was possible. We're going to talk a little bit more about cameras and approach and and, and how Dennis does the stuff that he does. Um, with that said, like Dennis, like hi, hey, welcome back to the podcast. You're the first repeat guest, first ever interview, and now the first repeat guest. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me again. You're always, always welcome. And so, yeah, like since last time we spoke, like even though it's only been a matter of weeks, like there's been some big changes in, in your in your approach and your kit. And looking at your website, there's been a fairly big portfolio refresh that's happened, which is incredible. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm kind of keen to talk a little bit more about about approach and how you physically achieve the end results that you're getting right now um but before we get into that do you want to tell the people like what you've been up to since last time we spoke yeah i have i fell down the rabbit hole the like a rabbit hole the film like a rabbit hole and i have now been um in search of adding a new film camera to my kit which would be the leica m3 so that was a little bit of a journey in itself i originally thought that I wanted to get the Leica M6. So I was doing a lot of research and um, I knew that I didn't want to go brand new for this one. So I was not interested in that one in the the 2022 version that just was just released. And I heard some things about um, some batches scratching film and I was like, oh, that's that's no bueno. Uh, So I was going to pick up a titanium M6 because if you know me, why not? Um, and yeah, I figured I didn't need to have the low pro approach of, of the classic black. Um, and I'm not going to be doing any street photography. So I decided to be a little bit more uh, boisterous with the titanium. And then suddenly just after talking to some friends, the M3 came onto my radar and I was asked, you know, what are you going to be shooting on there? And I thought that I would just strictly stick to a wider focal length which i know that that's not what the m3 is made for um but after thinking about it for a bit i already have the 50 version 4 simicron so i figured i would let that live on the m3 with its big beautiful viewfinder and the frame lines you know the 0.91 um viewfinder on there and i would switch things up and move my 90 over onto my sl2 so now I would have 28, 50, 28 on my Q2, 50 on the M3, which hasn't arrived yet, and 90 on the SL2 to have all focal lengths covered. I do have a 50 millimeter Voigtlander with a viewfinder that I intend to throw on there. So that's going to be extreme, but a lot of fun that I'm looking forward to testing out. That's pretty pretty awesome. And I guess for those people that don't know what the M3 is, that, that was the first Leica M camera that was ever produced. Uh, made from like machine brass, incredibly precision instruments. I believe they were initially made in the late sixties, um, fifties, and late fifties. You see, I stand yeah. corrected. I, <laughs> I had an M two, um, but basically, the difference between the M two and the M three is the M three was designed to be used like almost exclusively with a fifty millimeter lens. It had um, the viewfinder when you put it up to your eye looks pretty much exactly the way a fifty millimeter would look if you fill the kind of like rangefinder. Um, but it also had lines for longer lenses, like a 90 millimeter. And again, because because of the way that rangefinders work, you don't get like a different view every time you put a new lens on. You just look at the same piece of glass every time. Having a rangefinder that's built for the kind of focal length you're going to use is massively important because it means you get a better idea of what your framing is going to be. And when you focus, you can be a little bit more accurate. Um, and the M3 is, is beautiful, like no batteries, no light meter. It's just a camera with a really precise mechanism and a cloth shutter that's nearly silent. There's nothing really between you and the photograph you want to take. It looks absolutely incredible. It's custom. It's a custom job from Shueido uh, based in Taiwan. And I've spoken to them at length about this particular copy. And it is brass top plate, brass bottom plate, uh, brass accessories. So you see the the lens ring and, you know, the ears for the the camera strap and the knobs and everything. So uh, after some wear, it'll have a beautiful brass patina, which I'm after um, and just a great at a great price point. So it is a double stroke, which is fun and exciting for me. I thought about that too. And I have 
a Canon FTB, which, you know, that stroke, you have to take it all the way to the right. And I, as much as I enjoy that, I actually like the idea of a quicker snap right here, um, you know, as opposed to just having to take it all the way to the right and bring it back. Um, so that's going to be a lot of fun to shoot. I was uh, concerned a little bit about not having a light meter. And then I reminded myself that I haven't used a light meter in camera for years. I mean, I've always had my handheld light meter. Um, and then when I don't have it, you know, I've trained myself to know how to expose. So I'll be all right. I think that's true, especially considering you're going to be using it in conjunction with two of the digital bodies on most days. You're going to have a feel for roughly where you need to be in terms of exposure. If you're F2 and the Q2, you set it to the same ISO, you know roughly how much you want to overexpose your film. You can use your reciprocal rule. You can work it out. It's it's completely doable. And if you want a handheld meter, you can. You said you've been used to doing that. I mean, part of what I wanted to talk about today was a little bit more of the practical side of it, because... For those at home that, that don't know, everything you've outlined today and actually everything we talked about in the previous podcast, every piece of equipment that you own apart from that Leica Q2 is manual focus only, right? Right, right. And I've now begun to use manual focus on the Q2 as well. This is probably going to be scary for a lot of people. And I kind of want to talk about the rationale behind this and actually a little bit about more than just the equipment choices that you've made, but also about some of the the, the kind of some of the beliefs about photography and your ethos and how that informs these decisions. Because for anybody that's used to like a, a modern performing DSLR or mirrorless camera, they might look at that decision to shoot manual focus and think, well, why? What's the point? And obviously, I, I have my own opinions on this. We've talked at length about introducing imperfection in photography, like in, in our last interview and generally. But really, what I want to understand is why? Like if you had to explain to somebody that didn't understand, why is it that you've chosen to use manual focus, even with a camera that's perfectly capable of using autofocus? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. I think that journey begins for me when I first picked up a film camera, which is a Pentax 645. Um, that was my first film camera. So I went straight for medium format, um, a little bit of insight into just who I am as a person, like just going to go in, just dive off the deep end. Um, and that process compared to my DSLR with autofocus was just so different and foreign to me. And it was big and slow and having to pull focus and making sure that I nailed it because each frame counts. Um, and I just fell in love with that process. I fell in love with the outcome and the cohesiveness of these images that I was you know, putting together. There was a story there and it, I, I was no longer really having to search or dig that deep for the story in front of me, where having that film camera in my hand, I was able to be a lot more intentional and put a lot more thought behind my frames. Uh, so if you fast forward to, you know, getting the Fuji GFX and the Fuji 100 V and all that stuff, um, I brought that attitude and that mentality and that approach into those digital systems which were new and capable of handling autofocus and all that. So I would just turn off autofocus, which now continues into my Leica systems. And for me, it's just a better way of capturing the story. As much as I love efficiency, I feel that with the camera systems that have just super powerful brains and you know you're not going to miss that you're shot, I think for me personally, it just takes a it takes away a little bit of the life uh, out of the image and out of the process of making that image. It's I can't really claim it as mine or as much claim to it anymore. Um, so being able to have that level of control of every aspect of that picture is is really important to me because I get to call it my own. Um, and I've held you know I've shot with like the Sony A one before and it's a beautiful camera over engineered just amazing. And when I hold it up to my eye, it's like cheating. You know, it's like everything, you know, you're getting it in focus. It almost kind of reminded me like, of what the Canon EOS three was attempting to do with the eye tracking focus feature, where it was highly intuitive. Yeah, see, I have mine over there too. And it's like, it's so it's such an intuitive camera. Um, and it's an, it's amazing. And like, oh my God, everything's going to be in focus. And I know I got the shot, but am I really telling 
Am I inserting myself in this moment, which is important to me as a storyteller with my perspective and what I want to say about the moments I'm capturing? It's interesting you say that. that there's a um, there's a documentary. I'm not sure if you've ever seen it. It's called It Might Get Loud. And it, it's Jack White, uh, The Edge from U2, and Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin talking about making music. And the beginning of this documentary is Jack White taking a guitar string, a pickup, and a nail, and a piece of wood, hammering the nail into the wood to mount the string, putting the pickup underneath the string, and then playing a piece of slide music. And he, the words that he said when he did that was, I want it to fight back. I, I don't I don't want to pick up an instrument and have it be say nothing. I want it to fight back. I want it to inform the way that I I play. And like a lot of the time with music, bands like the Black Keys, bands like the White Stripes, and a bunch of others like Alabama Shakes, a lot of the things that kind of come from the fight that goes into making music those elements end up making it for me. There's snare rattle, like when you listen to the recording on like good headphones and you get to be immersed and you can hear the the guitar being played in the room with the drum kit. And I think I understand what you're saying. What you're talking about with photography is to say you want there to be a fight in the, in the in the process. You want to be able to be precise and you want to be able to work hard and get the result that you want but you kind of allowing a bit more room for serendipity. And it's not just a case that every single time the eye is going to be perfectly in focus. Like if there's motion in the scene, you might end up with a front focused image or a back focused image, but it's going to, it's going to tell you something about the way the person was moving. And it, even if, even if the person that's viewing the image isn't educated enough to know that's how you did it, like intuitively, we understand that that imperfection wasn't introduced because of a lack of skill. It was introduced because you're a human being with a perspective and there was movement. So very often, like when I hear people talk about like, I started this way and I want the precision and control and stuff. I understand that too, because for every person like you or me that might feel like there's a line that's being crossed that we didn't really want to go over where the camera's making decisions that maybe we wanted to make. There's somebody else that's working in an extreme condition that needs that technology to make an image that wasn't possible before. And I think the interesting thing to me is that you're making a, an odd set of choices that feel very personal to you. Like um, I mentioned before that you recently updated your portfolio and looking through it, the thing that stands out to me is how clean all the images are. Like there's no there's no excessive grain unless you're in a dark environment and it's it's kind of generated by the scene that you're in. Um, there's no like lifted shadows. You're not doing anything to make it look like you've, you've kind of printed it on matte paper or anything like that. You're not faking anything, but then there's a human element in that you've chosen focus and you've placed it somewhere and you can tell it wasn't a decision made by autofocus because it isn't the thing that's most prominent in the frame, or it isn't the place that an algorithm might choose to put your autofocus. You can tell that you've, you've put thought into it. Like specifically, I'm looking at a scene right now. Um, there is a, a couple sat on the bed in a hotel room, really super cool classic portrait, like hard light coming in from the side and critical focus is on the groom's eye who is almost entirely in shadow apart from one slash on his eye. Give that to an autofocus system. It's going to focus on the bride because she's in a much, much better situation. And I think that people miss things like that. And part of the reason why you do look at these images and stop is because you put more of you into it. And I guess ultimately the thing that's impressive to me is that you've refreshed your entire portfolio and you've allowed each environment to speak individually. So you've not conformed colors to match your color palette. You've made, you've allowed it to be what it was, but you've also made choices that mean that there'll be more variation in that. And I kind of wondered how, how intentional was that choice? Like how intentional and how, specific have you been when putting this together to try and allow your environment to tell more of the story and your perspective to be the thing that adds the character and not the camera so i think what's at the core of that process is to allow the image to be the image and what i mean by that is it's almost like whenever i'm photographing kids um, i like to tell parents like let the kids be kids 
you know, let them roam free, let them do their thing and let me capture that moment for you. You're going to be much happier than the level of stress that you take on when you try to get your kids to conform and to sit still and to look a certain way and to be perfect. And I don't want that out of my images. I want my images to be images and let those moments be those moments. And the environment informs me, the setting informs me, the lighting informs me, the energy informs me, all these things inform me. And I know what the image is going to become. And in the editing process, it's just, it's relatively easy. I do abide by certain rules when I go through my editing. Um, you know, simple things like I'll slide my contrast um, halfway to the left, if not 70, you know, two quarters of the way to the left to give me a flatter image. And then I can go down into the tone curves and adjust accordingly. Um, white balance is usually pretty good with Leicas, which I love their color science. So I'm not having to do anything too crazy. I have noticed that the SL2 and the Q2 oftentimes do see some color shifts in the same setting, which is odd. Um, and that can be a little annoying or frustrating. Um, I'm not sure if other camera systems experience the same thing, um, but there's something going on there where I notice that, you know, a batch edit might not work. So it's important for me to have that dialed in and know what I want out of that image. Um, my black and whites oftentimes are because I want to eliminate the distraction of color. And I want you to focus on a, a specific moment. Um, so, yeah, so I do think that the environment informs me a lot. And, uh, you know, as you know, I don't use presets either. No, and you were asking about batch edits. Like, that really isn't uncommon at, at all. And actually, lens to lens, you should see a difference in color and contrast. Like, it's... It, even in systems where they've color matched, like Sigma, for example, like basically all of their art line are color matched to each other. So there are still variations, but it's like quality control differences. And if you buy like a cine set, they'll go through and check that they're all color matched within a certain degree. Whereas with the stills lenses, they don't go at the same level. It's just that they're designed to match. And then as long as the production tolerances are good and you get a couple of good copies, they'll match. Whereas with other brands, like that isn't the case. And especially if you're using equipment that's been developed over like years or decades, like you mentioned, you got a version for Summicron Leica, which is, which I'm not sure exactly when that was built. Do you know roughly when that was produced? It was a while ago though. My copy is 1986. So that lens was made in the eighties and obviously technology and coatings and correction has changed. Like digital cameras don't react the same way to light. And your Q2 has the brand new Summerlux lens on it, which is specifically designed for that sensor. So if you're seeing shifts in color, it's very often because the lens is not the same design. And usually you can kind of get close by profiling that one lens, like looking at it and thinking, well, this particular lens shifts this way in this light. But with 80s lens design, it could even be as simple as there was stray light hitting the front element. And the, there's nothing you could do about it. And that's kind of the fight we were talking about before, like choosing that piece of equipment. You chose a, a characterful quality optic that is definitely vintage, but with very modern character as well. And that color shift is just a reality. Like it, it's going to happen. And again, by choosing not to correct that out with a preset or mask it with something, you were essentially saying like, no, no, that's going to stand on its own. And similar to the previous conversation we had where we talked about the different mediums you use, like a digital, like low quality film and high quality film was kind of the broad strokes. This is another way that you kind of, you're choosing to allow these things to stand as they are and make a decision to kind of use that when you want a particular aesthetic and not try and override that to kind of make it conform to your aesthetic instead. It ends up being eclectic. But again, the thing that ties it together is your taste which is a huge departure. That's the thing, yeah. So, and I wanna add that I am bringing in my Pentax 6.7 into the kit. So I recently re rearranged my think tank and I actually managed to make room for it, which is surprising. So now I'll be bringing the Pentax 6.7 medium format, the SL2, the Q2, a point and shoot, and uh, the M3 when it arrives. So that's five camera systems on me on a day. You know, and I think the purpose of that, um, it's exciting and it's fun, 
really, that's really what it is. You know, to be able to capture the day in that way um, sounds like a lot of fun, a lot of work, sure, especially for my assistant who's going to be carrying that six seven because I'm not, I'm not going to be lugging that thing around. Um, and what's funny is if you would have, if we would have had this conversation a year ago, maybe a little more, I would have told you that that sounds dreadful. And carrying two cameras is more than enough. Two focal lengths is more than enough. And if I, if I could, I'd have one body, one lens. And that's where I was a year and a half ago. And going back to the kind of things we were talking about in our last conversation is it's important for you to allow yourself to evolve and grow, you know, and, and not to limit yourself and box yourself into this, this type of photographer you're going to be for the rest of your life. I think that I've allowed myself that room and that freedom to experiment and be playful and grow and see what works for me and what doesn't work. And again, maybe in a couple of years, I'll, some, something will change. Who knows? But right now, all I know is that I'm, I'm enjoying the process. I'm having a lot of fun. And, uh, and that's, that's what matters to me. You're also making it clear that you could take a photograph with anything. And again, like, it speaks to an expertise that a lot of people don't have. Like, I don't know about you, but quite a few people that I know, if you handed them a camera they'd never used before, they wouldn't necessarily feel excited by that. There are definitely people that, that want to produce something specific and they've got a very, a very solid idea of what they like, that they know their own taste and that they're, they're at a point where they feel like they've got there. And once you get to like 95% done, like you think you, you're nearly perfectly dialed in there's a real resistance to kind of making changes that would get you that last 5% because you think, well, I could get 5% closer and get a hundred percent there, but what's more likely to happen is I might end up going backwards. So when you're making these decisions, it's not so much that people, other people wouldn't want to play. I just think there's, there's a, a worry that if you abandon the way you did things and you do add complexity, you're essentially running the risk that you're going to lose something that your clients find attractive in the first place. And again, like one of the daring things about it is that you're, you're doing, <laughs> you're kind of doing this in real time as well. Like cause literally it's only been like two months since last time we spoke and you're already making like drastic changes to your kit, even in that short period of time. And I, I understand what you're saying because I feel the same way. Like very often, if I don't try new things, I end up getting frustrated and, and I don't want to carry on making stuff because for me, the equipment is a huge part of what I enjoy about photography. Like I like, I like being able to learn something new. I like seeing what the limitations of a piece of equipment are. And weirdly, like when most people look at my work, I don't think you could tell that I was using a different camera system on basically every, <laughs> every shot that I took or published. Um, and actually for me, like I actually bought the camera you discarded. Like I've, I've just picked up a Fuji GFX 50, the, the original 50S and a couple of manual focus lenses to go on it. Because for me, I realized looking at some of your old work, just how much I enjoyed it. And I think part, part of the reason that you need to stay curious about these things is because you never know when you're going to find inspiration and, and where. And I think that if you're willing to do what you're doing, Dennis, and, and, throw caution to the wind a little bit, kind of let go of some of the kind of the steady stuff that you have and add a bit of room for other things. You can definitely get some enjoyment out of experimenting with new equipment. Now, I did have some like specific questions about the choices that you have made because like you said, the Pentax 6.7 is coming back in the kit bag now, which is great. Um, for anybody that doesn't know, like what is the purpose of that camera? Like what is it in your head if you had to explain to somebody why you're going to reach for it, what does the Pentax 6.7 do that nothing else does? The Pentax 6.7 currently has the 105 2.4 lens mounted to it, which is going to be arguably one of the best portrait lenses ever in existence. Um, I am probably not going to use it that way. I think I'm going to leave that at home or bring it with me and pick up a wider focal length lens. And use the 6.7 for, for storytelling, establishing shots, landscape imagery, um, maybe some environmental, some candids of a big group of setting, maybe like reception stuff. Um, again, it's probably not the usual way you would use that camera on a wedding day. But that medium format, I would, I would just love to see a ceremony 
or a landscape or an establishing shot on medium format. I think that's going to be really special. Um, I see a lot of YouTubers who are using these medium format cameras and uh, pointing it at like random homes and streets and things. And I was like, okay, I could do that, but apply it to my wedding. And that's, I, I don't really see myself pulling it out during portraits. Um, I think it might slow me down too much. So I think that's what I'm going to be doing with it. Like I already, I'm already going to have three cameras on me. Um, the idea of having my assistant hand it to have him hand me a fourth. Actually, I'm gonna have four cameras on me. You know, I'll have a point and shoot as well. So that's a lot already. The Pentax 6.7 has some of the best wide angle lenses of any medium format system out there. Like you're right, the, the 105 2.4 is the one that everybody raves about because it has a really distinctive look to it. But there's also others like the, there's a 75 millimeter 2.8. There's a 90 2.8, and they're both beautiful. And actually, you reminded me a lot of um, a guest that I interviewed last week, Benj Story. He's a, a younger photographer who does travel, landscape, fine art stuff, um, predominantly online, recently worked with Leica, worked with Kodak, uh, really great photographer. Um, and he basically has a Mamiya RZ system, like another 6.7 camera, um, and he loves it because it, it's got one job, and it only does that. And he recently decided rather than buying another one and just putting a different lens on it or just getting a different lens for the system he did what you're talking about here and basically made it so that in his head when he picks up that piece of equipment it only does one thing so he, he picked up a Mamiya 7.2 and he picked up a, like a wide angle lens for it and his thought there was he exactly the same as you he wants high quality negatives but he wants to show the breadth of tones that film can capture and not just kind of restrict it to just portraits only. Um, and for him, he wanted something as close to like a, a 28 millimeter wide angle lens as he could, but with that six, seven negative, something that was beautiful and larger and kind of captured more information. So when you did take a wide shot, you could look close and kind of see like, oh, what's that? Where is that? And you get more of a sense of context, more of a sense of place. It's not about using the large negative to to kind of, emphasize the depth of field more to make it shallower it was more a case of showing more because there was more in that negative that's exactly what i want out of that and i was actually thinking about possibly picking up a uh, mamiya 7 or 72 for its size and portability um, but for now we'll just stick to what i have we'll make it work yeah, exactly. And the other thing is that they're, they're expensive, trendy cameras mm -hmm. and that you've got providence with your Pentax system as well. Like the, the fact that it's where you started, it kind of feels like it's an element of history and a, a bit of story. And those are things that really matter, I think. I think that kind of developing, I know this sounds crazy, but developing an affinity with a piece of equipment can be a good and a bad thing. And it's something that I really think is missing in the digital world. Like you don't really keep hold of lenses even anymore because a lot of these camera companies will release new lenses every five minutes like sony has like six different 50 millimeter lenses yeah um which is insane like because you'd never really get to know the character or something you couldn't you wouldn't have the opportunity um so i could definitely see why you'd stuck with it so that takes care of the pentax Let, let's go for your other film options so you've got your point and shoot where's that getting used like at what point are you asking your assistant to hand you the point and shoot well that'll actually be in my pocket it's so small it'll just be in my pocket and I think it would be great for in-between moments um, to use it as a disposable camera. You know, I think where maybe I'm lacking imagination or creativity or I don't necessarily have anything to say in the moment, but I know that something's happening in front of me. Let's pull out that point and shoot and see what it does. You know, uh, clients love that too. You know, they, they love disposables. I'm seeing a lot more disposables on the day. So having that little Nikon point and shoot, it's tiny and just it fits comfortably in my pocket without a bulge or or it being uncomfortable um, is great. And that's that's exact. And it's a 28. So it's perfect. It's like an analog key to. <laughs> yeah, it's perfect. Speaking of, so obviously the, your digital kit currently comprises of two cameras. So you, you've got the, the Q2 and you've got the SL2. So those are two digital bodies with the same sensor made by the same company one of them has interchangeable lenses and is bigger the other one doesn't is smaller 
Um, so why are you picking the Q2? Is, is that your main body? Is that like where you're spending most of your time? Like, when are you choosing to shoot with that and not with the SL2S or one of the other myriad bodies that you bring in with you? So something's been happening lately in my work and just kind of great place to share. Um, the SL2 with the 50 hasn't really been inspiring me lately. And so I'm reaching for that Q2 a lot more. And it's great because I, you know, the distortion is amazing, so I can crop if I need to. Um, but because of that, that's because the the lack of inspiration with the Q2, I mean, I'm sorry, with the SL2, that's why I'm thinking of like, let's slap this 50 Sumicron on the upcoming M3, let it live there and see what I can capture on film. Maybe I'll be re-inspired with this focal length and let the 90 live on the SL2. And the 90 reminds me of images I was getting with the GFX you know, with the depth of field and the compression and all that stuff. So, and the portraits are just beautiful. So I think that going back to what we were saying, how each camera has a role, I think that it'll be easier for me to decide which camera I'm going to be reaching for and at any given time and moment. Uh, the Q2, I think that that 28, I look at it the way that most people look at 35s. You know, I just love that focal length. I'm not afraid to get closer. Um, I can still shoot a portrait with a 28 and make it look great. You know, and I, I know that I have that room, but it still works for me. Um, so I think it's just a fun little camera to have. I think, again, it replaced my 100V, which I enjoyed using that camera so much. And I know that you do as well. Um, the UX on that one was just amazing. Um, and I wish that we could transfer that over to the Q2. Um, but it was the Q2 sensor, you know, that really won me over. Um, so for me, the, the experience of shooting the Q2 um, is really what keeps me picking it up again. And that's really what I'm after right now. It's the experience. I kind of think it's interesting that we you kind of touched on that because obviously we, we were talking about roles for things. And honestly, I do love my X100V. Like it, It's probably the camera I've enjoyed most out of anything. It made me realize that even though my Canon equipment was doing everything I wanted it to, it never felt lifeless when I was shooting with it it wasn't fun and it actually prompted me to kind of move more heavily into Fujifilm. So right now I've got the X100V, I've got two X-H2Ss, mainly because I do video a lot and uh, video for jobs, et cetera. Um, and the Fujifilm GFX, like it, it's it's more of the same. It, it really does feel like it's just more goodness. Um, but actually I've been having quite a few people asking me about the Q2 because I have shot with it. Like um, a friend of mine, Paul Williams, he, he uses a Q2 a lot. Um, obviously you've been using a Q2. There's a couple of other people that have picked them up and just, they, they love them. And quite rightly so, because the sense is beautiful. It's clean. It's high quality. Um, but for me, like when I want a wide angle lens like that, I really do want my camera to fulfill the same role as you, you're talking about your um, point and shoot fulfilling. I want it to be, I want it to be that camera that I pull out when I when I know that something interesting is happening, but I don't want to impose myself on it. Like the character's coming from somewhere else, and it's strange because even other Fujifilm cameras don't do that. Like the the XH2Ss don't have a ton of grain. Uh, the GFX definitely does not have a lot of grain in it. Whereas the X100V, the sensor is a little bit noisier. The colors are a little bit more vibrant and it has a very different feeling to it than anything else I've got, even inside of the Fujifilm system. Um, so part of me wonders, like, is there anything that you miss in that switch? Because obviously the Q2 is a less camera from a lot of people's point of view. But is there anything you miss about that smaller body, smaller sensor? No, not the sensor. I, I, I would say the usability, the experience of it you know, the, the, the dials, the way that I had customized it. I mean, even just kind of flipping up the dial to set your eyes. So I think is, is part of it too. Right. Um, and for me, if I wanted to switch over to, um, uh, if I wanted to drag the shutter to get motion blur, it was just a quick flick of that thumb, that thumb wheel for me. Um, whereas with the Q2, it requires an extra step. Um, and I might have to, change my aperture or something but with the 100 to be it was just easier to use in that way um but i don't miss that picture quality and that's why i felt like i needed an upgrade because i wanted my work to match the gfx better and i also had received some feedback from other photographers that i had helped 
you know, as far as the 100 to be not matching their GFX files as well. So it was kind of an easy, and, and at that time I was looking for an upgrade anyway. I wanted a, a more well-rounded camera than the 100 I felt its limitations. And I was even looking at like Canons and R6s and just kind of exploring until I ultimately decided and landed on the Q2, which, you know, the rest is history. That's why I ditched the GFX and went with the SL2 to kind of have a more cohesive kit in that way. It's interesting um, from the point of view that the Q2 became like a gateway drug because obviously your point was like, I, I love the GFX, love it. But what I want is more of this, but more compact and portable. So what you were hoping for was the an X100V with a GFX sensor in it, basically. And what you got was something more than, because as you were saying, like you, you, you got a greater result. And I kind of wondered, so obviously for you, you then moved away from the GFX after getting the Q2. Was it just the case of wanting to keep it simple and have that kind of matching color palette across both bodies? Or was it a case of, no, this is offering me something more than, greater than, and I need more of this? No, it was it was keeping it simple. It was absolutely like, I love being efficient, keep it simple. I hate the editing process of having to match colors and different files and and all that stuff. So I was, how do I how do I, I was tired. You know, I, I also remember that I came from a world of having to match my film and my digital and then presets and film stocks. And, and it was exhausting and it kind of was just it sucked the fun out of everything for me, which is why I walked away from film, which I'm excited to get back, you know, into that story of how I'm now back into film. Um, so that was very draining. And again, the idea of having two camera systems that the colors didn't necessarily match and, I still love the GFX. I love that camera. I wouldn't be surprised if I ended up with a GFX R someday, you know, because those files are beautiful, you know. Um, but once I discovered that the SL2 shared the same sensor as the Q2, that just was like a no brainer to me, you know, and being like a workhorse system with the dual slots, I was like, okay, this is perfect. This was meant for a shooter like myself. Um, so I got to work and sold the GFX, picked up the SL2 and didn't look back. Those files are beautiful, though. I mean, I go, I, go, I look at my Instagram sometimes, like you know, I recognize the GFX files, and I'm like, oh, that's pretty. Like, I'm excited about it, honestly, um, because for me, it doesn't make any sense for the work that I regularly do at all. Like, th there's no reason why I should pick it up for work. So this, this was a choice specifically to do something for me. Like, I, I want to make images with this, and it is a personal tool, exactly like the X100V was. And what I'm hoping is that eventually I'll find a way to make it fit, because <laughs> I know that I love the results. I've borrowed it enough times to know how much I enjoy it. Um, but actually, that kind of brings me on nicely. So we've covered the SL2, we've covered the Key 2 we've covered the Pentax, we've covered your point and shoot, and that just leaves one thing. You're choosing to move what most people would consider to be their most commonly used focal length, a 50 millimeter, to a film body. And obviously, that's a bit of a quantum shift because it means if you want a normal perspective, you're going to have to shoot film. Like you've got no option. And not only shooting film, you have to shoot with a rangefinder. Talk to me about that because you've gone from like, I don't need to emulate the film look. And I'm glad that you said that because, again, the characters are distinct. And I think that makes sense now. Like you've, you've given yourself the freedom to not have to match everything, things can stand on their own. Is this a choice to kind of re embrace the film color palette? because you're now putting your most commonly used focal length on a film camera. First, I think that for th this decision, you know, anybody who knows me would probably say, of course he's doing that. Like, you know, why? of course he is. You know, I leave it to me to, to just throw a wrench in everything. And I love a good challenge and it shouldn't be easy. Honestly, it shouldn't be easy. Um, I love the challenge and for me, what I'm thinking and where I'm coming from and how I fell in love with film again is when I realized and discovered that film in wedding photography doesn't have to be about fine art. And it's more about the moments. And it's more about the timelessness, the nostalgia that couples are experiencing, um, the life in the image. And it's no longer about its palette 
or which film stock you're using or which film camera you're using or which lens, if it's an 80, if it's Zeiss, if it's a contacts, it's none of those things anymore. And our brides, our couples, they're changing and they're getting younger. And a lot of them are 90s babies. And there's this resurgence of nostalgia that's happening. And my wife is a great example of this. When, when we first met, I was in a point in my life of my photography career where I was just like, I'm done with film. Like, I, ha I don't want to shoot film anymore, you know? And she's like, oh, my God, I love film. I love film so much. And, and she's like, I love when it's like underexposed and, and grainy and messy and, and not neat. And I didn't really listen to her. I kind of just, just like, okay, whatever, you know, like you're, you're crazy. Um, you fast forward a year and a half into, you know, our, our relationship, our marriage and, uh, and, and look at where I am today, just sort of rediscovering and giving myself the permission to be messy with film, have a point and shoot, have a disposable, have a cheap thrifted film camera on you, you know, but then also there was this allure from the Leica, you know, I, I drank the Kool-Aid already, you know, from having from the Leica glass and the legacy that comes with Leica cameras and all of the great photographers of our time who shot with them, specifically the M3 and the 50, like Henry Cartier-Bresson, you know, so that's really where my head is right now. And taking on that challenge of well, what kind of imagery can I make with these cameras that all of these legacy shooters used, you know, just kind of leaving my imprint on that. And just, again, just challenging myself and, and seeing what the outcome is. I think that on a wedding day, you know, it's not the end of the world. If I really feel a certain way, I can easily just switch out, switch them out. You know, I can put my 90 away for a moment, throw it, throw the 50 back on my SL2 and then throw the 15 on my M3 if I really wanted to, you know, which the M3 would become a point and shoot at that point, you know? Um, so, and that's, in, that's originally why I bought that 15 millimeter to shoot it as a point and shoot. And then I was also inspired by the film, The Revenant, um, by Alejandro Nieritu and, you know, director of photography is Chivo. So I think they, I think I read, they shot that entire film with 13 and 14 millimeter focal lengths and of course, all natural light. So yeah, that's amazing. So I've been looking at a lot of imagery shot at, at these focal lengths and seeing what can be done and the possibilities. And that's exciting to me. Like, I want to bring that to a wedding day. And I don't, you don't see that. There was kind of a, a character in your work previously where you were trying to get high quality and pristine and flawed, essentially, in the same image. And obviously, those two things don't really sit well together. And now what I'm seeing more and more is there's an awful lot of your work that's getting cleaner. But the way that you shoot in details, for example, like there's, there's some stuff in your new portfolio that's got a much deeper depth of field than most people would shoot a tablescape with. Things like seeing texture in the linens that have been chosen for a table and the texture in paper, et cetera, different qualities of light interacting. These are things that people normally remove because they want that shallow depth of field imperfection. And then you're saying as well, like you want something where you've got your primary perspective can have a little bit of imperfection that you're not in control of. So say, as you said, like allowing it to be underexposed a little bit, not having the meter in the camera means that you don't, you don't really have the option to triple check it in the moment. You take your meter reading and you go. And if that segment of the day ends up being underexposed, it's underexposed. That's the way that it turned out on the day, but you're not abandoning the high quality because you've got those two other options there that are going to give you clean very clean high quality very high quality mm -hmm. and potentially even on the film side you've got another camera that's going to cover the scene on like a broader base with a much cleaner aesthetic the pentax 6 7 with a wide angle again like thinking about tablescapes and details would easily cover that with a wider lens i'm right now thinking about just planners being beyond thrilled and couples to see tablescapes on medium format. A lot of the, the other like round table discussions we've been having recently have been around things like gatekeeping and development as a photographer and talking about imperfection. And frankly, like a lot of that's kind of coming together in this discussion because the fact is you're not gatekeeping. You're doing literally opposite. You're telling everybody not only exactly what you're using, you're telling them the thought, thought process behind it. You tell them like the rationale is this because you're trying to take people on a journey with you and 
I just thought it was interesting because a lot of other people do get pretty protective about their business practices. Like they might hold on to a lens that they've had for years, like that that 90 mil you were talking about. Some people might be the kind of people that have been would just use that privately, make it the primary lens. And then whenever anybody asks them, oh, it's just, it's just an old lens because they don't want people to know and to find it. I'll tell you what lens it is. It's actually a TT Artisan Noctilux 1.25. And you buy that, and you and you buy that thing to shoot it wide open, and no other reason. You know these Noctilux lenses. That's that's why you get them. I have a TT Artisan Noctilux point uh, nine five, which I hate on my SL two. I just hate it, and uh, I tried selling it, but I think I made the mistake of taking pictures of it with a high quality camera. So when you look at it, it looks like a, like a like a scam ad. You know, like not to. I, I need to take pictures of it with my iPhone. But I'm actually excited to test it on the M3 and see what 0.95 looks on film. Uh, how it renders with ones and zeros is just like not a lot of fun. So that, that should be interesting. So I'm going to hold on. I'm going to hang on to it a bit longer and then see what I can do with it. So I might keep it. Um, but talking about gatekeeping, I am guilty of one instance where I was doing a bit of gatekeeping, but I believe for the right reasons. Uh, there's a photographer that works with me and he was very interested in the Q2 and he had the 100 B and he was asking a lot of questions about it. Um, and I'm very familiar with his work, but I insisted that he hold off and wait a bit until he mastered his 100 V or just his craft in general. And he didn't listen to me, of course, and, and got the Q2. Um, and then I thought about that for a moment. I was like, was I, you know, because I do believe in that, you know, you, you've asked, you, you've talked about these things about like underexposing and all these things. But for me, I get to rely on my experience and come into a day knowing that like, I'm okay. Like, I don't have to worry about those things because I put in that work. I put in those hours, I put in those reps to know that my brain has my back where if whatever setting is in front of me, I know what to tell my camera to do. And that's something that I highly recommend and urge every photographer do for themselves is to have that level of discipline, to have that desire to master the craft of photography in that way, so that whatever job you're approaching, whether if it's street photography for your own personal portfolio, a corporate job, a wedding, headshots, family photos, whatever it is, you're prepared and you know exactly what to do and you're not fumbling and it's just one less thing to like, it's one less obstacle because that's really what it is. You know, that lot, that lack of knowledge and experience is an obstacle. It gets in your way. So uh, that was my one instance of like kind of somewhat gatekeeping where I wanted him to like, dude, let's work on your craft first and then graduate to the big boy. But then he was like, ah, screw it. You know, let's just go, you know, but I think if you have the means. That's literally the opposite of gatekeeping. What you did was like, <laughs> no, no, the real flex is when you can use the kit in the way that nobody uses the kit because it's too difficult and it still works. It's like you're a chef. You give somebody the recipe and tell them exactly how to make it and yours still tastes better. That's that's basically what you're talking about. You're, you're talking about being so good that you could tell them, give them chapter and verse, this is exactly how it goes, and you still end up making something different. Like that's the opposite of gatekeeping mind. Like I'm just, I'm just going to say that right now, like telling them like you need to, if you put the reps in on this, this next level is going to be going to be better. That's like telling them to train properly before they try and lift the heavy thing and break their back. And I think that's, that's wonderful. So I, I don't agree. That isn't gatekeeping at all. <laughs> it's like, I'm just going to put that out of your head. You, you, you can, you can breathe easy. Your conscience is clear you are you are still sharing openly and i actually wanted to come to that because this is this is another thing you're going through all these iterations and i wondered how much of this is to prove to yourself that you really are a master of your craft because i feel like testing yourself is important so i talk to my wife a lot about childhood traumas and the circumstances surrounding our childhoods that mold us and make us who we are as adults. And something I grew up listening or hearing a lot from my folks was, if you're going to do something, do it right, or don't do it at all. Or hearing things like, I don't care what you do in life, but whatever it is, be the best. You know, so 
coming across people like um, I remember meeting in my my junior high school. There was there was this young man who was the janitor of our school. He was in his early twenties, and you can tell he he had a, a rough life. And we heard his story, and he had been to prison very early on. But that young guy came out, got the job as a janitor, but then the end of his story is he owns the company who had all the contracts for the, that particular school district. So it's one of those things. It's like, it doesn't matter what you do is just take pride in it and do it right and do it as best as you can. You know, watching documentaries like uh, Jiro Dreams of Sushi, you know, where he's uh, after perfection, knowing he's never going to attain it, but also understanding that that journey is going to take you far beyond the next person next to you who's just kind of shooting for the stars, you know, and I love that. It's like aim for the stars. Well, I'm, I want to go beyond the stars and see where that takes me, you know? So I think that for me, it's uh, when I feel like you were talking earlier about that 95%, when I feel like I'm there and I'm getting close, I kind of just want to scrap it and see like, okay, what else is next? What else can I do? You know, like I've gotten there, but then I'm, I might be afraid of that 100%. I don't want to, I don't want to be at that 100%. I like the chase. You know, I like to feel like, okay, what's next? Like I did this, I accomplished this and I pushed myself this way. How else can I push myself? You know, I've never shot a rangefinder before. I used to be intimidated by rangefinder cameras. I used to, I, I held up, oh, my buddy, Joey Kennedy, this years ago, uh, we shot together and he handed me his M6 and, and uh, I looked at the viewfinder and I, you know, caught my focus. I was like, this sucks, dude. Like, this is not for me. Like, I don't like this at all. Like, why would you do this? yourself and then years later like here i am chasing this iconic rangefinder system and i'm left eye dominant by the way so i'm not going to be able to hold his rangefinder up on my right eye and see the world in my left eye i'm going to be hiding behind my behind my camera which is how i've always shot all my cameras um but again i love the challenge you know so i'm, I'm excited to see the type of work i'm going to create uh with this camera with that being said, I don't believe the camera defines you. Again, at the end of the day, they are just tools, but in your hands, they can become something more. I think you hedged quite nicely at the end there. You kind of said, oh, it's not about the camera, but I, th I think part of the part of the funny thing about this is that you've got this kind of, there's definitely a dual nature to what you're doing. It's like, whatever you're gonna do it, do the best. But then every time there is an established best, you've decided to pick something different. Like if you were going to be using the best camera, you'd be shooting in a, a Sony A1 with a 50 millimeter 1.2 GM on it, because that's what everyone says the best camera is, right. because it makes life easier for them. But the fact is, you've decided that no, 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 I have to, I have to work harder than that. I have to, there has to be more of me in this. And you've taken like a very, your dreams of sushi is a great example to use because you've taken the craftsman approach. You've been like, no, no, not how do I get better results more easily? How do I get better? How do mm -hmm. I grow? So when you're saying, oh, the gear doesn't matter, it, that's not true. It does. Because if you chose the A1, you wouldn't need to grow, and you wouldn't, because none of us do. We all atrophy. It happens. If there's right. a convenience there, you'll use it, and then you'll get used to it. And you'll assume that you could never go back. You could never do it again. And yet you were talking about the Leica system and being left eye dominant. Like I am left eye dominant as well but I shoot with my right eye now because when I first started shooting, I used an M2. That was my gateway drug camera. I used that and I used like Zeiss lenses because I love Zeiss, always have. And at the time I also hated it. I hated using it. But every time I got film back from it, I was like, this looks different. I love it. Because there was a removal of the one-to-one -one view of what I was going to get. I didn't know what the framing was going to be perfectly. I knew roughly what was there. I knew what was in front of me. I knew that I'd hit focus, which is the stress points for me. They were gone. But composition was always that little bit looser than mm -hmm. I would have chosen. It was always that little bit more shifted, like out from my perspective. So when I was looking at the final images, that lens is like to the right of where my head would have been. So it's not even seeing from the same point of view as I am. It was more, I was directing somebody else's vision. And that, was really appealing. Like every time I got the film back, it was great. But in the moment it was frustrating because I thought I'm never going to, it's never going to come out the way that I saw it. It's always mm -hmm. going to be slightly shifted. And I think there's a philosophical element of that as well. And I think part of the reason so many people love, love it as a shooting experience is because of that. Mm -hmm. When you get your film back, it doesn't look the way you expected, 
And I think part of the reason why digital lens don't have the same appeal is because you can see it straight away. And rather than feeling like it's a fresh perspective after a couple of days or a week to wait for that film to come back, you're seeing it immediately and just realizing it wasn't what you saw and think and treating it differently. Um, so I understand what you're saying. The gear doesn't matter, but I think it does. And I think that the more that we allow ourselves to pick things that aren't the best and the more we rely on our own skill and craftsmanship, the more likely we are to enjoy the process of making the photographs. Yeah, you're 100% right. And recently, my I changed my mind about that sentence or statement that cameras are just tools. And I watched a YouTube video, uh, GX Ace, you're familiar with him. He made this video, which was like the first 30 seconds, I it just completely smashed my my beliefs and views on cameras are just tools. And this idea that holding a masterfully crafted piece of equipment in your hands can alter your state and alter how you shoot. And that's exactly what happened to me with the Q2 as my gateway drug. From the moment I unboxed this brand new camera and the, the flaps just kind of come undone and the drawers come out, you know, even the packaging of the Leica to holding it in my hands, I, I knew instantly that I was holding something special and unlike anything I'd ever held before. You know, my, cam my previous systems were kind of uninspiring in that way. Uh, we've talked about the 100V you know, having great UX and, and the GFX being awesome as well. But the built quality of this Q2, the heft, its weight, um, how you, how it just feels in your hands when you lift it up to your eye, it's just a different experience. Same goes for the SL2 and, and I'm sure the M3. And that's really why I sort of ditched that ideology of like cameras are just tools, especially because I've reached that point in my craft where Okay, it's like I understand my craft. Now let me let me do something for myself and let me reach for the best looking tool there is. Let me it's kind of like going out and getting yourself a nice chef's knife or a nice watch or an old Porsche, you know? It's like that's really where I'm at now. So, if I'm going to go out and do this right and do it the best I can, I might as well have I might as well do something for myself and get myself that beautiful uh, repainted, you know, brass patina m3 around my neck i think there's a lot of joy in that too because it shows that you care enough about your craft to make that your indulgence as well like because you could just go and get a rolex and it'll probably appreciate it a little bit faster than the leica <laughs> but th this this is the thing like i think that a lot of the time it's very easy when you're doing this as a living to look at your craft as just requiring a toolbox and that's mm -hmm. it and for me, after talking to you last time, like this is not a coincidence. Like picking up the GFX and some manual lenses, that that was in response to that largely because I knew that I wanted to shoot with it, and I was like, oh, if I could shoot my way, I would shoot with. It was always the G <laughs> it was always yeah. the GFX. Yeah. Um, and you're always having this conversation with yourself, and I decided that you know what, it's time to put up or shut up. It, it, do you actually want to shoot that way, or do you really enjoy this more modern method more? Because frankly, since moving to Fujifilm, I really like the way that they, everything about the company's philosophy is exactly what I, I, I align with. Like their lenses aren't sharp compared to any other camera system. Like I brought the brand new LM, like linear motor lenses, a 33, which is like a 50-ish lens. I got an 18, which is a 28-ish lens and a 56, which is an 85-ish lens. And they're all like F2 or 1.8 equivalents if you're talking about full frame which is a lot more like in focus than I'm used to. But the first time I shot with a 33, I was gobsmacked by just how good the rendering was. Like the backgrounds were soft, but interesting. Mm -hmm. Skin didn't have like excessive amounts of detail. It has like halation, like you'd put like a bloom filter on the front of it, but mm -hmm. it's just natural and it's not overpowering. The color rendition is perfect. And I don't say that lightly. Skin tones just look incredible. And I've put other lenses on the Fuji system and they don't look anywhere near as good. It's the same thing with the QT. Like when you got that camera for the first time, it's like it just everything fit. Mm -hmm. Like the lens on that and the sensor are paired like literally perfectly. That it's yeah. clear they're made for each other. Even though they designed it initially for a smaller sensor, they've 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 
worked right. They've, they've done the tweaking. They've made sure that it's a perfect match. And for me, that's what Fuji are doing. That's what Leica are doing. Like they, they've just released the new set of Summicron lenses that are all at F2 across the board, and they look suspiciously like the Panasonic lenses, but yeah. they've got a different f-stop and they're made in a different factory which means that even if they're the same optical designs like has gone through and reworked it all retooled it all because it doesn't quite fit and i think that choosing brands that have that kind of attention to detail it's very rarely going to be the correct choice because those things cost money and they can't be no. measured so you can't go into it and say well this is 50 percent better build quality than the other camera because the fact is the reviewer is going to use it for a week and we'll never really know what it feels like and they won't value the the, the hand feel of, of a <laughs> of a camera in the same way because they may have a different hand shape to you. They might not appreciate the fact they've calibrated the EVF like perfectly mm -hmm. because they're not having to use it day in day out, and it doesn't matter to them. It's not like a replacement for their eye for like eight hours of a day. So I know it's getting a bit romantic about gear, but what I was saying initially was that sometimes it's easy to forget that there are camera companies making incredible stuff right now. And I think part of the selection that you're, the selections that you've been making is trying to find those things that kind of still align with those old philosophies. Because we look back at old film cameras and nobody's lost enough after the, the kind of random Canon camera that came out in like 19, 1997 yet. Sure. But most people know what a Contax T2 is. Most people know what a Leica M3 is. Almost everybody knows what an M6 is. People look at the Mamiya 7. But there were tons of other cameras like Bronica's and all this kind of stuff, and those aren't remembered. But if you look at the time, that Bronica would have been the correct choice because it was cheaper and just as good as a Hasselblad. But nobody remembers that. They remember the Hasselblad because that was the, the better tool, the one that made you feel something when you used it. It's so funny. It took me 10 years to get to this place of appreciation of the cameras in my hand. 10 years is a good amount of time, man. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But the, the fact is as well, like we, we're we in a position now where we, we have this information, but the industry isn't in the same place. And I think one of the reasons it was refreshing talking to you is you're somebody that somebody in your position would be somebody that would be using a standard kit. You'd be mm -hmm. using a Sony or a Canon or whatever else, a Nikon, or, it doesn't really matter. But you'd be using the newest, you'd be looking at like endorsements from companies and all this kind of stuff, and they'd be throwing kit at you or whatever. It was just refreshing to see that not only were you not doing that, but you were taking a step away from the whole kind of industry that had formed around uh, post-production for photography and that you weren't even using presets. Now, I, I wouldn't recommend that for everybody. <laughs> post-production should be an extension of your brand as well. Um, the way that you edit and the way you choose to treat your files says a lot about your philosophy behind your photography and it's something your clients notice. I just think that you're very good at recognizing when and where that matters. And like I said, during the course of these last two conversations, I feel like I've got, we've got a pretty clear understanding of just how nuanced your gut reaction is, that you, you're somebody with a very well-trained gut and you listen to it and it shows. Um, and for other people, it, you, they might need a shorthand. They might need help to kind of get there. And you've spent 10 years, like you said, learning from your film color palette and the labs that kind of helped educate you, et cetera. And you've done the growing and you've realized now, after you've put in your 10,000 hours, exactly what matters to you. Yeah, definitely. My priorities have shifted. I wanted to thank you again for spending another hour with me on this podcast. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It's always so much fun talking to you. And I, I'm glad that I have someone that I can get these things out because these are like, again, the inner monologue in here is just insane and it's constant. So I get to uh, get it out with you. That's great. Like on, on my web uh, website, since starting education, I called consultations like therapy uh, for your gear, like or therapy <laughs> for your post-production because uh, it, it is like th th these are things that people don't talk about. They're just kind of seem like you take the picture and it'll be amazing. And then nobody talks about the, the reality of what it takes to make your brand feel complete. And it, it is a personal thing and you shouldn't feel ashamed for not, just infinitely knowing exactly how to make your like ideas come out of your head. And it's, it's an easy thing to talk about when somebody else is making the gear, but it's even more personal when you're talking about post-production and all that kind of stuff. So I'm always here for these kinds of conversations. They make me very happy. So thanks for having it. Thanks for having me. Next time I'll be here with all of my cameras so I can pull them up with you too. <laughs>